greet our friends everywhere with Chapter 10 of Thunder in the Heather, the story of John Knox. This is another in the series, Stories of Great Christians, and is brought to you from the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. Mary Tudor was on the throne in England. She was the first woman to rule in English history. Because of her persecution of Protestants, she was later called Bloody Mary. English Protestants were already grasping the severity of Mary's rule. For some, it meant the stake. And to make matters worse for John Knox, he had published a pamphlet which condemned her rule. This ignited the Queen's wrath to an even greater degree. John was urged to flee to Dieppe on the continent with English exiles until the storm blew over. I'm coming. Oh, what weather! We thought we'd get blown across the channel and back into England. And that will never do for us. Well, there'll be few English that will brave this weather to cross to Dieppe. We don't know. With the fire and stake waiting on that side, I think the wind is not so fearful. I hope we're not interrupting your work, Mr. Knox. I see you've been writing. No interruption. We brought you the mail. I thank you for that service, Mr. Giles. I see you do a lot of writing, Mr. Knox. I suppose so. Little good it does. Oh, don't say that, Mr. Knox. It does a lot of good. Mr. Giles, when I arrived in Dieppe four weeks ago, I came a man of 40 with less than 10 groats in my pocket. I I'm glad you said that, Mr. Knox. I, I wasn't quite sure how to introduce the subject. But the English community in Dieppe wants to pay you for the services you have been rendering here. Yeah, that's fine enough for filling the pocket. But it's my heart that's empty. Don't you think we'll ever get back to England? I didn't know. I wonder if I will ever see the hills of Scotland again. Why, the whole British Isles lies in the power of... of the devil. But on the continent, the Reformation is thriving. Aye, here and there, here and there. And did not true religion prosper in England one year ago? But think of Geneva, Mr. Knox. John Calvin has made that city a fortress of truth. I wonder what he thinks of what's happening in England. I don't know. But I do know, if I ever get home again, I'm going to let my religion be my own business. And, uh, what does that mean? Well, it's going to be a matter between me and God. And I'm going to stop worrying about the church. Oh, that's very courageous of you indeed. As long as I keep to myself and believe the true gospel, I believe that's all that is expected of me. What a coward's way! Didn't you realize, after all you've seen, that to shut your eyes to what's going on around you is exactly what the tyrants want? Excuse me, Mr. Knox, but you don't have a wife and children to support. No. No, I didn't have a wife or children, although God grant I may. But yours will be a poor excuse for you when in the day of judgment you try to shelter yourself under the plea that... Although you have done nothing to resist the enemy, you've secretly disliked him all the time. Keep him to yourself. What God will ask you in the day of reckoning is, what did you do in the battle against idolatry and corruption? It's action that God demands. Uh, and, and here I sit. Oh, you must not feel that you're doing nothing, Mr. Knox. So much writing has come out of your pen. And such a ministry of preaching to the community here. All the same, it's nothing. I'm out of the battle here, and I didn't know what to do. He's good enough at telling other people. Oh, never mind that. <clears throat> I know a man like you won't be long in finding out what to do, Mr. Knox. We must be leaving now. I, I, I thank you for the mail. Uh, and the visit. Good day to you, sir. Uh, good day, Mr. Knox. Good day.
There. This letter ought to be a proper introduction of myself to Mr. John Calvin of Geneva. And I would that I could be there as quickly as my letter. Shall I put a little more wood out the fire before I go, Herr Calvin? No, thank you. It is a cool evening. I should be quite warm enough with him. Perhaps another candle on the table. Mm -hmm. If you like. You go blind reading that letter. Thank you for the candle, old sir. You must go now, it is late. It is a good thing I'm not gone. I thought it like is, uh, is uh, Mr. Calvin busy. Come in, Peter. I thought you had gone to bed. I don't want to impose on you. You've been so kind to me already. Not at all. Well, sit down. When I fled to Geneva from Saxony, I had no idea I would ever meet you, sir. Let alone be offered the hospitality of your house. Ah, oh, but... I'm interrupting you. Y you are reading a letter. Not reading. Puzzling over it, Peter. It is from a Scot by the name of John Knox. Have you ever heard of him? No, sir. He seems some kind of political revolutionary. He's coming to Geneva to seek my advice, to question me on matters of government and religion. I do not blame him for seeking your advice, sir. <laughs> I'm afraid he has a wildly exaggerated idea of my position here. The Reformed Church in Geneva is not yet secure. You're like Noah's Ark, tossed in the flood. <laughs> but Mr. Knox believes us to be without problems. Perhaps he can be of help to us? <laughs> I doubt that. His letter concerns his own country of Scotland. He seems inclined to revolution. And this is no time for me to lend support to an erratic Scottish firebrand. Does he say in the letter what questions he wants to ask you? Oh, yes. Uh, he wants to know if a woman can lawfully rule a kingdom and if it is permissible to overthrow by military violence magistrates and authorities who enforce idolatry. He asks, to which party must godly persons attach themselves, to Christian nobility or to an idolatrous sovereign? They do not seem like questions that can be quickly answered. That is true. And I have more problems of my own than time to solve them. However, the man is coming from a far land, and I shall have to see him. You do not understand, Mr. Calvin. These questions that I ask you are not for writing down in a book with the answers beside them. I need the answers to know what to do. I realize, Mr. Knox, that your country is in conflict, as is the realm of England. The word of God gives the command for Christians to be subject to authority. But what if the laws of the rulers are opposed to the word of God? Then one must obey the word of God. But still, one must act peaceably to the ruler. But does a man act peaceably to a, a murdering lion, devouring the lambs of the flock? We do have examples in Scripture where God has directed men, according to his will, to rise against their rulers. But this must be done in the full knowledge of the will of God. England is ruled by a Romanist and a, a woman. 
In Scotland we have no ruler, only the nobles fighting among themselves for power. The heir to the Scottish throne is a mere lass, and when she reaches her maturity to, to claim the throne, is it lawful that a woman should rule a kingdom? Ah, oh, it's black enough to think of in England, but to see skirts draped over the throne of Scotland and all these women destroying the gospel of Jesus Christ and demanding obedience due to rulers, uh, I, I, I cannot think this is right. But it is important to exercise caution and reason, Mr. Knox. I do not understand. Can a soldier in the midst of a bloody battle reason? Can he be cautious? No, he must strike out or be destroyed. Now, I'm not thinking of bodily safety, Mr. Calvin. It's the gospel that will be stamped out if men dinner act. As long as the actions are the result of earnest prayer and the deep searching of the soul, not right. I have worked years to preach the gospel in my own country and then in England. And I have seen those labors destroyed. Until now, in the whole British Isles, there is less truth preached than when I was a lad, listening to the story of the burning of Patrick Hamilton. Why, there have been such burnings since his time. His name has been lost in the names of hundreds more. You would not think me rash, Mr. Calvin, if you'd seen what I have seen. Perhaps not, Mr. Knox. And I pray that God will use all your efforts and energies to his good. Mother, tell me what you're putting in the letter. It's quite the right thing, Marjorie. You needn't be concerned about that. It's high time that Mr. Knox came back here and married you. But, Mother... He explains in his letters how difficult it is for him to return to England. He'll be caught in Baron. You cannot ask him to return. Ah, then be a goose. He doesn't have to come back to England. He can go to Scotland, and the wedding can take place there. Mm, Scotland is just as bad. Nothing of the sort. Many English Protestants have fled to Scotland, and the Reformed Church is growing again there. But for how long? In my letter to Mr. Knox, I've explained the whole thing to him. I've told him that since the mother of the young Scottish Mary is ruling now, she did not dare oppose the Protestant party in Scotland, even if she is a Romanist. I think I should like to live in Scotland. It does seem safer than England. Aye, so should I. So many English have returned to the Church of Rome for fear of the stake. We can be thankful we live in Berwick. Even so, the fires of Mary are spreading more north all the time. We must be ready for that. Oh, Mother. Well, dinner think of that now. We have a wedding to think about. And so we conclude Chapter 10 of Thunder in the Heather, the story of John Knox. This has been another in the series, Stories of Great Christians, and was produced in the radio studios of the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago.